Welcome to today's seminar. Uh, this presentation will be recorded and it will also be uploaded into our Sion YouTube page. So I can see there's a couple of people still coming in, but I think it would be the best uh, to just start just now. So today's presentation uh, or presenter is uh, Gina Arena. Just to give a little bit of uh, background about her journey, Gina, she joined Sion Arid Les Notes back in 2016 as an intern, and then she was based in Prince Albert, wherein she was overlooking at the project at Tierbeck and Vuva Crow, that was under the guidance of Sue Milton and Richard Dean. After she completed the uh, intern program, she then went to UCT to register for her PhD. And then that was under the supervision of uh, Tim Hoffman from UCT, Elga from the Merve from the Arid, Arid Lens Node, and uh, Tim Oconia, formerly with Sion. So today she'll be presenting some of her PhD work wherein she was uh, doing a lot of work on uh, looking at the, the influence of climate change and uh, land use on vegetation change along the rainfall gradient. And that's on the Eastern uh, Karu. So she just recently uh, completed her PhD and then she will be presenting uh, some of those work with us uh, today. So Gina, you can uh, take us through. Thank you. Thanks so much, Janina, and thank you to everybody for being here this morning. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, Chili, will you just let me know if you can see the screen and I'm going to just turn off my video. Okay, it's, yeah, it's looking good, yeah, I can continue. Okay, great, thank you. Um, all right, so thanks so much again for the introduction. I thought I would begin by acknowledging and thanking a few people who, without their support and guidance, I wouldn't have had as smooth and enjoyable a PhD experience. So Chalida has already uh, given you a bit of a background into uh, my journey. I started with Seon in 2016 as an intern for Arid Lands Node, and I was based in Prince Albert where I was uh, supervised by Sue Milton and Richard Dean, two tremendously humble but ambitiously smart people who have been really keenly interested in my academic development over recent years, and Joe Henschel, who has been very encouraging. He gave me a little push towards doing my PhD, and um, he also always went the extra mile to help me on journey, which started in 2017. And my PhD was supervised by Tim Hoffman at the Plant Conservation Unit, Helga van der Madva and Tim O'Connor. And it really has been a real pleasure working with and learning from them. But last, uh, at la and lastly, but not least of all, um, would be Dr. Pit Roo, who sadly passed away about two and a half months ago. Pitt and his colleagues had put together a really impressive baseline of vegetation surveys that were scattered across the Nama, Kuru, and Succulent Kuru in the 1950s and 60s. And he used a subset of these for his own PhD. And then of his thesis surveys, Tim Hoffman um, repeated these for his own PhD in 1989. And then those surveys were repeated again by Morto Masubalele in 2009 for his PhD. So this has actually just been a really great honor to have followed in the footsteps um, and to have participated in this long-term study. So I'm gonna start with some basics about the drylands of South Africa. When we talk about the Karoo, we are usually referring to this large 
area, which is split into the succulent and Namakuru biomes. The succulent Karoo receives winter rainfall and year-round rainfall in the southern parts, and it's a global biodiversity hotspot for its rich diversity of succulent species. And then the Namakuru receives summer rainfall and is considerably species poor in terms of plants. The dominant land use practiced in the Karoo has been livestock farming for the last two centuries. But more recently, the Karoo has really become very attractive for renewable energy development, mining, fracking, and astronomy um, because of its very low human population and for its wide open spaces and clear skies. And you'll see in a bit that the Karoo, as well, at least I think it has a really fascinating environmental history, which has played a very crucial role in the development of agriculture and research and our ecological understanding of semi-arid drylands in South Africa. So as you approach the grassland biome in the east, the mean annual amount of precipitation increases. And it's this moisture gradient which largely determines the natural transition of dwarf shrublands into grasses um, at the eastern margins of the Namakuru, um, where the two biomes merge. And the most prominent idea in our understanding of this concept um, actually stems from John Acox's hypothesis um, that this gradation of shrublands into grasslands was actually a direct result of mismanagement of the semi-arid rangelands in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. He believed that the Karoo had once been a much grassier state in earlier centuries, and especially in comparison to what he had been observing in the 1940s and 50s. And he suggested that various Karoo felt types had begun to expand eastwards and northwards into areas that would have otherwise been occupied by grassland. Um, and he predicted that by the year 2050, these invading shrublands would have progressed further east, and that this invasion of shrubs was also considered to be much less ecologically and economically productive. So this has been termed the hypothesis of expanding Karoo, and at the time of his pioneering work, this idea of invading shrublands was, um, or at least under grazing mismanagement, was consistent with the globally accepted United Nations definition for desertification. Prior to his maps and hypothesis, there had been some initial attempts by the South African government to understand and address the environmental issues that were negatively impacting agriculture in the Karoo. Um, so there were investigations into drought and soil erosion and desert encroachment. And these were set up while John Acox was conducting his extensive fieldwork and formulating his observations. His maps proved to be a very powerful visual message in raising awareness of these environmental issues. And so this galvanized attention on developing agricultural research. And this was when Pet Roo and his colleagues from Hurtentain built up this archive of surveys across the Karoo. And they also tested various grazing systems on Karoo vegetation. And essentially all of this research went on to further inform the theoretical framework um, for semi-arid degradation. In the late 60s and 70s, the government intervened through the subsidized stock reduction scheme where farmers volunteered to reduce the number of animals on their felt. And then this scheme was followed up by the National Grazing Strategy um, in 1985. And although the outcomes of these two interventions weren't immediately successful, one of the positive things that did come out of this was its network of extension services in the Karoo which was quite successful at creating a greater awareness of the recommended stocking rates and also for having helped farmers to improve their felt through better um, management practices. 
And then towards the late 80s and early 90s, the Karoo Biome Project was developed. And this was extremely important for developing the ecological theory for Karoo ecosystem dynamics, which really up until that point had not really been a major focus of research. Um, and then around the same time, Tim Hoffman tested the expanding Karoo hypothesis in his PhD research in which he provided evidence for the first signs that shrublands weren't actually invading the grasslands at the eastern margins, but that he had found grasses were increasing in cover. And this trend of increasing grasses persisted for another 20 years after that. So one of the key criticisms of Acox's hypothesis that emerged in the literature was that he had largely ignored the influence of fluctuating rainfall in driving these changes. Um, but the long-term grazing experiments at Kirtentain have to a very large extent helped us to understand a few things. Um, firstly, that summer rainfall benefits grasses, but heavy grazing in the summer will reduce grasses while winter rainfall will benefit shrubs, but winter grazing will increase grasses. And then a long-term decrease in annual rainfall will reduce vegetation cover. And recent findings from Dustin Dutoy's research at Kirtentain has also shown that the long-term trend for annual rainfall has been increasing since the 1980s. And this has provided a plausible explanation for this increase in grasses in that area. But two of the main questions that needed to be addressed were whether or not these vegetation and rainfall trends were representative over a much broader area um, of the moisture gradient. And so um, particularly I was interested in finding out how far west could we detect increasing grass cover and increasing rainfall. And then secondly, how might these changes help us to better understand whether or not a biome shift has actually been occurring over the past 70 years. So I set out to relocate and repeat as many of Pitt's surveys as I could in the Eastern Karoo. And I used the descending point method to do this. And these were also accompanied by landscape photographs, which we repeated in the field. I conducted semi-structured interviews with landowners in order to understand how they perceived climate, land use and vegetation change over the study period. And then I also investigated the long-term trends in a few climate variables. So I'm going to take you through a few examples of repeat photographs that have documented two important findings about vegetation change. The first finding is that there has been a vegetation shift from shrub dominance to grass dominance. And then the second finding is that overall cover of vegetation has improved. So this is an example of one of the grazing trials at Hurtventain, which was mostly dominated by shrubs and bare ground. The site today is now a mix of perennial grasses and shrubs. This is another grazing trial just across the road from the previous photograph. Here we see the foreground shows heavily grazed shrubs and a high percentage of um, bare ground. But these trials are no longer in effect. And so the vegetation has recovered over time. But you can see that there is, or it appears that there's proportion, a greater proportion of perennial grasses in uh, relation to shrub cover. This is the common edge rangeland in Middleburg, which was dominated by unpalatable shrubs and bare ground. But today the site is very rarely grazed by livestock. And there is also a healthy abundance of a highly palatable C4 grass known as Tetrachne dredii. And this is perhaps evidence of um, uh, an absence of grazing. This is an example of a commercial rangeland. Although there is 
a fair amount of bare ground today, a lot of this has been filled up with perennial grasses. This is another farm, but now in the higher lying areas of the Stormberg grassland, which is east of Middleburg. And this site was almost completely dominated by C3 grass um, known as Tribolium purpureum. And there were a few patches of Lycium shrubs in the foreground that were protecting that uh, palatable species of Tetrachne. Um, and then in the background of this image, you can see these white patches over here. These were um, patches of Aerogrostus chloromelis, which is a C4 grass. And today, this is no longer a pure stand of tribolium, but it's a mix of grasses with a much higher cover of Tetrachne judii. So the vegetation at this site has a higher cover of vegetation, but it's also an, has an improved diversity of species and condition. In some other places of the Eastern Karoo, you can see the establishment of acacia Karoo shrubs in the plains. And then on the hill slopes, there's a very small increase in the cover of dwarf shrubs, but in general, the cover of taller shrubs like Rosirosa have remained relatively stable over time. So by estimating the cover of grasses and shrubs in the most common landform units that we photographed, which were plains and hill slopes, and then by calculating a metric to estimate the relative dominance of dwarf shrubs versus perennial grasses at each site, we could describe the shifts that um, have occurred between years. So if you're looking at the graph, um, a, veg a vegetation state of shrub dominance falls below the zero line, and then a vegetation state of grass dominance falls above the zero line. So firstly, what I want you to know about this is that the sites have been plotted along the x-axis in ascending order according to the mean annual precipitation at each site. So what you're seeing are shifts in dominance um, that are illustrated from the driest sites in the west towards the wettest sites in the east. So if we're looking at the top panel, which represents the plains landform unit, we see that there are many more sites that fall above the zero line in 2018, indicating that both sites have experienced a shift away from shrub dominance towards grass dominance. And this shift is evident at quite a few of the sites in the Namakuru. The grassland biome sites appear to have variable changes, but quite a few of them fall below the zero line of shrub dominance. And then the bottom panel, which represents the hill slopes, indicates that hill slopes in the Namakuru have become slightly grassier. And in the grassland biome, they've become slightly more shrubby. But what about the vegetation transect surveys that we repeated in 2017 and 2018? What do these show in terms of the percent changes in growth form cover? Well, firstly, the cover of perennial grasses has increased at all sites in the Namakuru biome and the grassland biomes, but also at sites which were located at the higher altitudes of the escarpment. And these sites have unique vegetation communities because they contain a combination of fainbos elements, karoo shrubland and grassland. The cover of unpalatable shrubs has remained largely unchanged and the cover of palatable shrubs has increased at sites in the Namakuru. But another really interesting finding was that the cover of bare ground has decreased significantly at all sites. Now, if we take these same data and calculate that metric of relative dominance of dwarf shrubs and perennial grasses, we find that there's a similar pattern that emerges showing that Namakuru sites have experienced a shift away from shrub dominance towards grass dominance. So really our first takeaway is that the Eastern Karoo has experienced a shift towards becoming a grassy environment and that this 
structural change is evident um, on the Namakuru boundary of the biome transition. But my next question that I needed to answer was whether or not these shifts could also be defined by shifts in species composition across the biome transition. So using species composition at individual sites in the 1960s, we found that there was a distinct separation in terms of species assemblages that were grouped according to Karoo, grassland, and then our higher altitude escarpment sites. The 2018 data indicates that sites in the grassland and escarpment groups are more similar in terms of species composition, but that there's still a relatively clear separation um, between the grassland and the Karoo group. So in other words, the integrity of Karoo plant communities has remi remained quite stable and distinctly different to the plant communities of the grassland. <clears throat> if we take the same data one step further, we, com we can compare range and condition between years, which is represented by our grazing capacity as the number of hectares needed to graze one large stock unit. So we find that the condition of all sites in all three groups have improved. So for example, if you um, historically, you would have needed 105 hectares to graze one large stock unit, but today you only need 23 hectares for one large stock unit. And this is because there is an improved diversity and cover of climax grasses and palatable shrubs. So what does this mean in light of ACOX's hypothesis of expanding Karoo? Well, firstly, over the last 70 years, shrublands have not been invading the grasslands in the eastern Karoo. And secondly, the improved condition and cover of these rangelands might indicate that they are um, economically and ecologically more productive today. Sorry. Um, sorry, everybody. Just, um, I can't. Uh, Caitlin, how do I get rid of this thing at the top of the screen? Is it the Zoom thing? Yeah. Um, if you just like move your mouse out of it, it should um like make it small again. Does that make sense? Um, it's not doing it, but I'm not sure. Okay. Anyway, I'm just going to carry on. I can't really see the top of my screen, but it's all right. Sorry about that, everyone. Um, so anyway, the information um, that we obtained from the semi-structured interviews um, provided some insight into landowner perceptions around climate and land use and vegetation changes that have occurred over the study period. And um, so this figure might be a bit overwhelming uh, to look at. Um, especially if you're not familiar with text mining techniques. But all I want you to uh, understand about this is that the term frequency inverse document frequency is intended to reflect how important a word or a string of words are to a document in a collection of, in this case, interviews. So I'll give you a summary of what this data shows. Um, landowners emphasized that in comparison to the past, um, there have been a fewer number of paddocks on their farms, which mean, might mean that the average size of paddocks used for grazing livestock is much bigger. And they also emphasized that they rest their felt from grazing for longer periods of time, and that they use a combination of the group camp system and Alan Savory's method of grazing management. Historically, sheep, goats, and cattle were the dominant animal types farmed, but today a diversity of livestock and wildlife are managed in the region. 
farmer perceptions around vegetation change imply that they believe that the fault is in a generally much better condition today because there is a, um, a greater abundance of climax grasses in the region. And they ascribe this more to the fact that farmers are running fewer stock um, on their felt and not really to any um, um, understanding that climate might be responsible for this improvement. Um, in fact, the perceptions around climate change indicate that they do agree that temperatures are rising, but many of them perceived rainfall to have been become highly variable and unpredictable. Um, many of them felt that rainfall was arriving too late in the season, while others thought that rainfall was occurring much earlier in the summer. And then the last two um, graphs um, highlight the fact that most landowners are quite concerned about the increasing trends of livestock theft, um, increasing prevalence of drought and fire, and also challenges, they, have, they face challenges pertaining to human wildlife conflict. And all of these affects the economic productivity of their farming operations. Um, but I wanted to look at the livestock data and the climate data to see what it, we could tell from the trends. So I investigated the long-term trend of livestock numbers using the magisterial district level census records. And this indicates that sheep numbers have steadily declined over time. Goat numbers have also declined, but to a lesser degree, and cattle and equine numbers have remained relatively stable. Now these trends, um, especially those of sheep numbers are reflected for the Great Anama biome, which has been reported by Hoffman and colleagues in a paper that investigated land use and land cover change in the Karoo. The rainfall data for the Eastern Karoo illustrates that the climate cycles through multiple decades of wet and dry phases over time. So towards the end of the 19th century, we can see that con the conditions were relatively wet and this is reflected in the literature and is perceived to have accommodated those high numbers of sheep, um, which accelerated the rate of degradation in the mid 20th century. But then the climate entered a considerably long and dry phase with sporadic and short periods of relief from this prevailing drought. This is the same time that the drought and desert encroachment committees were set up and when John Acox was um, conducting his fieldwork. And then the original surveys done by Petru took place towards the end of this dry phase and then the subsequent re-surveys all occurred during this wet phase in the climate, perhaps maybe except those that were done by me, which took place in a relatively dry period. So if we investigate the individual rainfall time series at each site, we find that the majority of sites, and particularly those that are in the Nama Karoo boundary, have had positive or increasing trends in annual rainfall amounts. And um, most of the sites distributed on the grassland boundary have had decreasing trends in annual rainfall. The seasonal trends indicated that the majority of sites have experienced increasing rainfall during the early months of summer between October and December. And about half of the sites have experienced a decreasing trend in the late um, summer months, which are between January and March. Autumn rainfall trends were spatially variable, but winter rainfall trends, although they were largely non-significant, appear to indicate increases, which once again were evident at sites in the Lamaku. So these trends in annual rainfall are therefore described by a seasonal shift of decreasing rainfall in the late summer towards increasing rainfall in the early summer, which is also further described by increasing rainfall in winter. 
And so the spatial coherence of these trends provide supporting evidence that a shift in the relative dominance of shrubs to grasses over the last 70 years is possibly strongly driven by rainfall. The trends for mean annual temperature appear to be consistent with warming at the majority of locations, um, although these were largely non-significant trends because of the generally poor availability of long-term temperature records in South Africa. And then finally, the long-term trends of wind speed and APAN evaporation were predominantly negative for the study area. And reasons for declines in wind speed and APAN evaporation have normally been attributed to global meteorological changes. But a fairly recent paper by Chapman and colleagues has shown that these declines in evaporation are probably more likely a product of changes in local conditions that have increased surface friction um, on account of increasing vegetation around the pans and uh, which resulted in declines in wind speed. So I have two more slides to wrap up. Um, so in summary, we know that the Eastern Karoo has shifted towards a grassier environment. Vegetation communities remained compositionally stable. Range and condition has improved, and especially at the Lama Karoo sites where condition has improved fivefold. And overall vegetation cover has increased. The most plausible drivers for these changes has been a 70-year period of wetter conditions, which are supported by the spatially coherent and extensive increase in the amount of annual rainfall and a shift in the seasonal concentration of rainfall to the earlier summer months, particularly at sites that are on the Nama group um, boundary. And then local warming and declines in surface evaporation may also promote grass production. And we speculate this would be a positive feedback of increased vegetation cover and subsequent decreases in bare ground cover. Land use changes might play a secondary role in driving the changes in vegetation, um, but these shouldn't be underestimated considering the fact that there's been a steady decline in the number of sheep in the region. Um, and for the fact that landowners today are a lot more knowledgeable about um, managing the stocking densities and the managing their fault. Um, but there are a variety of socio-ecological challenges um, that might inhibit productivity. And we don't really have a clear enough understanding of how these might be indirectly impacting vegetation change in the region. So considering what the literature has taught us um, and what we've determined through my PhD, um, there are a few predictions of future trajectories of change that are worth mentioning. So if this, in the scenario that the climate should remain in a wet phase of the rainfall regime, the grassy layer and high fuel loads will be maintained. And we suspect that fire has already become a more frequent occurrence in this region, which historically wasn't as common. So fire is expected to reduce the shrub layer, um, but also slow the rate of the recovery of shrub species and therefore enforce grass dominance because grass is re-sprout quickly after fire. And so this increase in fire is predicted to um, result in a compositional biome shift and um, purely by the extirpation of fire intolerant Karoo shrub species. In the scenario that the climate will enter a dry phase, <clears throat> or at least a phase that um, is similar to that prolonged dry phase in the 20th century, um, we expect that the cover of vegetation will be greatly reduced. Um, changes in vegetation structure will depend uh, upon the shifts in seasonal rainfall. So 
if winter rainfall increases and summer rainfall decreases, then we expect that shrub cover will increase. Um, but if both summer and winter rainfall decrease, then an overall reduction in vegetation might occur. And then lastly, if drought follows a period of increased fire frequency, this might push certain areas into an unprecedented state of degradation. Um, so a long-term study like this has not only helped us to understand a bit more about the nature of vegetation responses to climate and land use, um, but it has allowed us, or it allows us to improve our predictions of future uh, vegetation change under different scenarios. The study has also highlighted um, the dynamic nature of shrubland, grass and vine boundaries, but that these trends that we picked up on in the Eastern Karoo contradict the global trends for um, similar semi-arid grassland environments, which are currently undergoing shrub encroachment. However, my sense is that we don't really know enough about the influence of fire in this region. And I'm, although my study is largely correlative in nature, we need to set up carefully designed experiments that would test different treatments of rainfall, fire, and grazing on grasses and shrubs. So I think I'll leave it there and um, take any questions. Thank you so much for listening. Thanks a lot, uh, Gina, for such insightful uh, presentation about the Eastern Karoo. Uh, so I will open up uh, questions. It's either you can pop them in the chat or you can uh, post a direct uh, question where you can uh, raise your hands. So is there anyone with uh, a betting question? I think I put them to sleep. <laughs> there should be definitely a question. Yeah, man. Thanks for uh, uh, opening up about the, the influence of uh, the rainfall regime, what you can do to, uh, to the field and also uh, the sound uh, grazing management practices that I mean the farmer now are adopting to. Mm. Hi, Gina. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. 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 We really don't understand properly the interactions of drought, seasonality, and possibly fire, it's, and how those things overlay each other to bring about changes. So, yeah, what we need is long-term but more complex experiments. Yes, absolutely. Thanks, Sue, for the comment. I think particularly the fact that we, this part of the world hasn't really and um, been experiencing fire um, to the extent that they are now. Um, and we, yeah, it, we don't really know much about how the interaction between fire and drought are going to affect grasses and shrubs. So I'm hoping that it's not going to be as dire as I think, but yeah. Any other um, insights from anyone I'd really uh, find interesting if you'd like to share? Okay, Gina, there's another question by Johan. He asks, does fire totally kill or just damage shrubs above ground? Oh, thanks, Johan, for the question. Um, so Justin did um, has done some work on this, and, and I believe that his study showed that there were certain uh, shrub species that are intolerant to fire um, and so 
it, if they didn't kill them completely, it definitely slowed the rate of their recovery. And then there are other species of shrubs that are possibly more tolerant to fire, but we still really just don't know enough about um, shrub tolerance, I mean, you know, tolerance to fire uh, from the perspective of dwarf shrubs. Um, and of course, it, there are other studies um, that have looked at the flammability of certain uh, growth forms. Um, and so that might also be a really important uh, aspect to incorporate into a fire study is to um, investigate flammability of uh, different, say, grass species, um, or is it all just the same because it's just grass, it's fuel load for fire. So um, definitely fire will damage shrubs above ground um, and then probably slow the recovery rate. And I know that at Tierberg, um, a fire experiment uh, that they conducted there, although it's in the succulent karoo biome, they did show that um, it took a really long, it's taken many, many years. Um, I think if I remember correctly, it's almost 20 years for some species of shrubs to recover from fire. So I hope that it provides you some sort of an answer. If I could comment there too, that Tierberg experiment done by Cedra Flower, it tended to show that the more palatable shrub species are often wee sprouters, presumably because they store carbohydrates in their roots, and those wee sprout sit after fire, and they also wee sprout after cooking, but the unpalatable ones often don't. Mm. Another interesting thing to consider is that some shrubs maintain small stored seed banks and bounce back very fast after damage or disturbance, such as Galenia africana, whereas others don't maintain any seed in the soil whatsoever. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, so that's also another aspect that we really don't know much about in the Eastern careers is what are the seed banks? Um, uh, yeah. How what is, what is composed? Well, at least what is the composition of seed banks in the soil? Thanks, Sue. Good question. Any other questions? Suggestions? I see Tim's hand is raised. Hi, Tim. Hello. Should I get the go ahead from Chilelo or can I just... Oh, yeah. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, I can go ahead. Oh, thanks. Uh, <laughs> thank you, um, Gina. That was, uh, that was wonderful. I read the thesis, so um, <clears throat> it was nice to see it put together so nicely like that. You know, one thing which um, has always intrigued me and it came out very strongly in your talk is that it seems... You know, everyone who's worked on this is, would sort of conclude that it's both rainfall and it's grazing, uh, which has had an influence on the relative proportion of grassiness. But different people have kind of emphasized different um, aspects. Some say, would say it's perhaps a bit more to do with rainfall, and others might argue from the data that they have that it's a bit more to do with grazing and these are two very different um, drivers and you can do something about one of them but you can't do much about rainfall but you can do something about grazing and I just wondered whether Seon um, has any experiments or has any uh, thoughts about um, how to try and uh, perhaps you know get a bit closer to answering that question about the relative contribution of grazing versus rainfall on the um, sort of cover and palatability and production of, uh, of arid uh, rangelands. I, I don't know if there are any experiments anybody from Seon might want to comment or you yourself, Gina, might want to have um, a few thoughts on that. Thanks. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, I think maybe uh, I don't want to put you on the spot, Jalila, but you've done a lot of work at Hurtentain and I, I wondered if they had done rain out, used rain out shelters at some point, um, 
I don't know if you'd uh, like to comment on that. I, yeah, we haven't. So we just putting them together, testing them at the office, and uh, we'll be deploying them uh, probably later this year or early next year, but we haven't uh, put them there like, as yet, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I, I do know, I'm, I think I'm, um, I don't see Justin here today, but uh, he's participating in that BizMop um, study, which to be honest, I actually don't know much about it. But I do think that they are um, trying to test the effects of, um, uh, yeah, well, different water treatments and the effect of um, uh, nutrients, I think. But please correct me if I'm wrong. If anyone knows about that, <laughs> please do chip in. And these are um, situated at Kruipentain, so... Um, if he were here today, I'm sure he would have um, provided information. Okay, any other question? I see um, there are some in the chat, Jennifer. Okay, there are a few questions in here. That's a question. So how about the, the ecological rule of ants and, term, and termites in relation to rainfall and, uh, and seed banks, seed beds? Mm, that's such a great question. Um, you know, I don't know anybody uh, in that part of the world who has been, who's done work on ants and termites um, in relation to seed beds, of course, we do know about um, the work um, at Tierberg, um, of course, again, in the succulent curry biome, that uh, they have a big impact on um, seed banks um, over time. Uh, and especially uh, during uh, dry periods, um, so, of course, when there is no rainfall, then um, and if it's in the felt that has been overgrazed and is not producing um, uh, your palatable species, then there is a reduced uh, seed bank of palatable species, and um, there might be an overabundance of non palatable species in the seed banks, um, which I correct me if I'm wrong, Sue and Richard. Um, I think you have a paper that does show um, or speak to that. Um, but from the perspective of the Eastern Karoo, um, I don't know anybody who's been working on that. So, yeah, I'm sorry, Johan, I can't answer that better. Yeah, at Kruvendain, I know Justin Dito, he, uh, he did uh, map some of the timelines and rooms, but I don't know how far I get to start uh, study. Mm, okay. So this another question here, that, are there estimate of game animal numbers, I mean, across the region? And then does, does that has changed? Oh, yes. Okay. I see Julia has her hand raised. I don't know if she'd like to speak or if... Um... She wanted to elaborate. Hi, um, actually, I raised my hand about the Bismop uh, oh, question. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, I don't, I'm not going to claim to speak too much about it because I haven't been involved and I don't know the whole of it. There just was a plot temporarily near our offices, so I got to see it, see that one. But that plot was, um, they had a number of different plants representative of different biomes, and they were just trying to see in the ambient climate of all the different plots, which species survived or didn't survive, I guess. Um, okay. So there, you know, there was the fainbor species and the thicket species and grassland species, and so there was different arrangements mm -hmm. of them. But I don't know, I think there were other treatments as well of those, of like watering and other things. But mm -hmm. I think there was also just ambient climates. Would they, if they didn't have any competition, would they survive? Okay, thank you for that. Um, and then to answer your question about the estimates of game animal numbers, um, 
so I I didn't um have a game number or game yeah game animal number estimates um in the data I was only looking at livestock numbers um but I I know just um anecdotally from speaking with landowners that their sense is that game numbers are um well some of them might say that it's they're exploding um. But uh, there is, of course, um, there are national parks in the area. There's the Camdebu and Mountain Zebra National Parks. And there are a couple of other um, private uh, game farms, especially around the Grafrenet area. And some of the landowners that I um, spoke with did imply or did mention that um, you know, they have issues with uh, game jumping over their fences onto their farms um, and that they are, you know, there's like an explosion in warthog numbers and some of the bush pigs are also um, increasing in numbers. So, I mean, of course, these are just, you know, the, this is their sense. Um, I haven't looked at numbers um, and I think that kind of information would probably be available from the national parks at least. Um, but I, I have a sense that they, there's probably a lot more wildlife um, today than there was historically. Good, any more questions? Okay, it's like we don't have any more questions. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Gina, for uh, your insight, our presentation about the Eastern Karoo. So, just before we close some of this uh, seminar, so the next uh, seminar will be uh, on the 5th of November. And the presenter is uh, Ati Fikili. He will be presenting about, or his title is Stepping into Unfamiliar Territory to Understand the Past Coastal Marine Environment. So I would like to thank everybody who participates into this uh, seminar. And then I wish you a productive day and good luck for the weekend. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jenny, and thank you everyone for your questions.